Hi, good morning and welcome to the ZP vlog um, or rather the ZP developer zone. So we do this um, webinar every um, Thursday at 8 a.m. London time and it's really just intended to be a um, answering of questions that come in during the week. So I'll sort of jump straight into it and sort of give the, um, how do I say, the first sort of slide around this. And um, we always say that there is the ZP Academy. If you have technical questions, um, there's a couple of free courses on the ZP Academy. It's probably worth saying that, you know, we do do these webinars. Um, just a side comment, we actually did a, uh, a free webinar the, uh, these days um, every month on FoodSense, um, which is one of our products for measuring kind of food quality. Um, we do have our collaborations. Um, just had an email this morning regarding um, a collaboration that we have with Cranfield. Um, we do obviously offer jobs. We have been recruiting in Norway um, of recent. We do have our ZP um, developer zone. Um, so, you know, we have a sort of you know, a website dedicated to that. And then we do have our workshops. I just want to say on our workshop front, um, we um, host a workshop. Generally, we try to do it once a month, one in the UK and one in um, Norway. So there's one in um coventry in the uk we have a site in coventry just very near um warwick university and i say very near literally sort of 100 meters away um and we also have a site um near fairly near oslo um in norway we also have another site in swansea in the uk as well but we have a couple of sites around the globe um but anyway we do do a workshop once a month um in at least two locations um so there's plenty of opportunity to kind of um and a lot of what i'll talk about today is actually sort of done in much more depth i would say in our workshops as well it's probably worth saying that if you see a link today i will have um hopefully put that link already underneath the um youtube video so question number one that came in is how to achieve a minimally viable product doing ivd so um i'll discuss that we have a platform that if somebody has an in vitro diagnostic um it's quite quick um and when i mean quite quick we did have a client who'd already been working on our screen printed electrodes um at christmas time they became a client and then in may they were doing and they successfully did a demonstration for their investors with all the hardware in place when i say all the hardware it was really an mvp a minimally viable product um that they achieved but question number one how to ch achieve an mvp in the ivd space um, question number two is a quick one just really about um, glucose sensing in cell culture um, question number three is is really ongoing it's just um, an update on something that we're doing with a client or a, a collaborator on easy flex question number four was um, really just a sort of fun little interaction that I had this week um, talking about um, vapor deposition of gold electrodes um, and question number five was really about year analysis um launching companies around year analysis and the and the expected um i'd say cost of goods um that people could um expect so talking and i in some ways question number five and question number one are kind of related so um i think the concept of mvp minimum viable product is not the big concept in the ivd space in the vitro diagnostic space but it's something that we promote um at the zp um I've always had this mantra that, you know, if you're going to fail, fail fast, um, that's sort of from MIT. Coincidentally, I am actually giving a lecture next week or, um, at a conference at MIT. Um, but this is the IVD. Um, this is our um, minimally viable product. So what we say to people is if you have an idea and it's about sort of bringing the sample to a sensor, then we probably have a platform to kind of allow you to go and explore that idea and get some preclinical data pretty quickly. So we have a meter and we have a um, sensor. Um, now the sort of step one of all of this is um, we have to identify what is it your matrix? What's your matrix? By, by that I mean, is it um, blood? Is it urine? Is it um, plasma, serum, um, saliva? You know, we have to understand what that matrix is. So question number one is what's the matrix? Step number two or question number two is confirm your clinical range. So we're asking people, you know, tell us what your you think your clinical range is. I mean, we often know what these clinical ranges are. So if it was glucose, you know, it's sort of one to 
you know 20 millimolar that's fairly evident to anyone in that in that field if it's cortisol it may be something more like sort of 50 um maybe 20 to 100 um i want to say nanomolar but i think it's pretty sure it's nanomolar um and then step number three is we would actually make some synthetic samples um in that range and test them this by the way is assuming the sensor already exists so now at zp we do have an a very large range of sensors so sensors often do exist and if they don't we would often do what's called a proof of principle study where we spend like 111 hours getting together a first version of that sensor so having assumed that the having understood that there's um what's the sample matrix i.e blood saliva um what's the clinical range um we would then make up samples that reflected that clinical range and we would test them on the sensor now what this would do for us is this would give us our essentially our calibration curve um, and also I say partial analytical validation. The reason I say partial is because we are ISO 13485. It's really important that we get, you know, we try to make sure that we use consistent um, definitions um, and analytical validation ISO 13485 means something quite significant. It means thousands of hours of work, uh, but this is partial analytical validation. Um, we would program that calibration essentially into this sense it all platform so i suppose i should say that the idea of converting an ivd idea into an mvp we can do it extremely rapidly because we really have this um mvp platform so really at this point now by step six you actually have your preclinical device and you can kind of go into your preclinical studies because then we're really keen for you to get into a clinical setting and start testing real world samples because this is really when the calibration is going to start coming about because in the real world then you're able to run you know take a sample run it on the new device or the mvp and also run it on a on an eliza plate or an hplc or an lcms run it in some other way so that you've got two data points one of them is from this new device you know you're trying to develop this low cost ivd and one of them is from the incumbent um, analytical method, which is probably lab-based and very expensive. And then we can do the correlation. So in order to get to like an MVP status pretty quickly, um, we would want to use this platform, this Sense It All platform. And um, we would, well, I make the assumption the sensor exists. If the sensor doesn't exist, we have to do a proof of principle development on that sensor. What's the matrix? What's the clinical range? make up some synthetic samples, do a calibration, um, put that then into, you know, essentially an app that's developed, specific, not developed, sorry, we, we already have the apps. It's um, the app, the method file that was developed um, has to go into the app so the app can tell the meter what to do. At which point now you can sort of, we can program the app, ship the meter, ship the sensors, and you can start put into a clinical setting, um, at which point then you have to start um, testing the real samples and this is when the, this is when the real hard work let's say starts but that does mean that once upon a time people would spend more than two years doing this kind of effort and i think we can compact this down to now um months rather than um years um i know i've already described it but this is really what's happening um there's a sensor there's a meter there's an app the app architecture is all in place there's also a cloud um system called julie this is very important because when you're doing sort of remote clinical work you know and somebody else may be even gathering the data actually the data at least will go to the cloud so you actually you can sort of eyeball it and see it in real time see what's actually going on so sample goes on sensor app talks to meter um, app talks to julie database and we actually get the, the um, results and i mean the raw raw signal up in the um up in the cloud it's important that because Getting the raw signal means we essentially lose no information. Otherwise, you just get a number. And, you know, if the number says zero, was well, that zero because it generally was zero or zero because there was no sample on the sensor? So we can get the raw signal, um, and that's really important as part of quality control, or quality assurance, I would say. Um, question number two came in about glucose sensing. I mean, at ZP now, I started my career in glucose sensing, I think, in 2001. We started ZP um, nine years ago. This is our ninth year. So we've got a long history in glucose sensing. 
So one of the questions is, would your sensor survive gamma um, radiation and describe um, sensor reliability? I think radiation is fine. You've got to really, when, when um, trying to sterilize glucose sensors, you can use EO, ethylene oxides, um, E-beam, um, gamma radiation. I would never really um, prescribe or um, suggest that people used um, autoclave. This is kind of high temperature and high humidity. I think that would be a, a bad thing um, for biosensors. But would we survive gamma radiation? Yes, as long as you keep the, um, essentially keep the dose down, I would say. Um, and we have been putting a lot of effort in, in um, continuous glucose monitoring for veterinary and human health over the um, last years. I mean, it's easily spent um, more than 5 million euros on CGM um, in the in the last nine years. Uh, that was 2018 data. This is um, 2023 data. So you can see that we've never stopped really um, doing um, glucose sensing and you know essentially improving and coming up with an entire stack. So the little image here, there's a sensor there, there's the electronics there, there's a power supply there, and there's a transducer for sending out the data as well. In fact, a, a predecessor to the technology I just showed there, we call that um, the fish tag, was actually this, the EZ Flex. EZ Flex has been around as long as EP's been around, in fact. Um, so we did get a video in this week where um, we have a user who's using the EZ Flex, um, and they were basically getting um, no signal, and they were good enough to send us a video. So we had a quick look at the video, and I'll just pause the video there. So we had a quick examination of the video. We live in a great era now that it's you know we can all send video to each other and images pretty quick and it really helps with obviously you know troubleshooting and stuff like that and you can see that we do we do look at this stuff you know and um i think it's partially what makes zp slightly unusual is um we really understand the stuff that we're um you know often the products that we're actually selling which you obviously would you'd hope but it's not always the case um so what's happening here then is um they were applying a voltage. They were looking for a current. They had a fixed resistor across it. I do have a, a video here um, about um, how potential stats work, and I'm not going to, um, you know, obviously not going to go through it now, but I just want to just say there's a link about that um, potential stats because the reason I bring it up is because we looked at their, at their setup. They were essentially leaving um, the reference electrodes. In fact, when I looked at this, out of the circuit. So it was, um, unfortunately, it was never going to work. Um, um, in fact, when I think, yeah, so we've advised them to um, do a slightly different setup. They put a 20 kilo ohm resistor on there. They put a wire on there. So the wire's got like a resistance of 1.7 ohms. Um, the fixed resistor's got 20 kilo ohms. So that's all making sense. They're still struggling though. So we need to have a look at their settings next and try and figure out um, what's going on there. But it's just a reflection that... Um, there's sort of two tiers of working with ZP. There's working with us directly where, you know, we have project managers, project team um, meetings, you know, and the, and the sort of client support is very extremely high. And then we do kind of free support through um, venues like um, this webinar. You'll always notice that even when we're supporting people, we very rarely, if ever, only with their permission, actually mention names. You know, it's all anonymized. Um, question number four that came in. This is a... I think actually really quite a fun one for me actually. Um, so somebody bought a um, USB potentiostat off us and they also bought some um, um, some hypervalue electrodes and it was nice because actually they tested these hypervalue electrodes in five millimolar sort of fairy ferrocyanide solution. I suspect it was fairy cyanide um, and they got nice cycle of voltammetry. Um, They'd also made some homemade um, 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 gold electrodes as well. Um, and they sent me a sort of note of, it's good because they sent me an image and they sent me the data. Um, and what, you, what I can see here is that as they, um, they do a cycle of voltammetry, but on the um, oxidation wave, it gets very um, noisy. I mean, and from their own observations, they also observe that they get delamination. So I think essentially what's happening here is that they get a, they do a forward sweep, they do the um, oxidation, the um, material starts to delaminate, so it gets very noisy. Um, 
they go up to about 500 millivolts and then they come back again now on the reduction wave the gold at this point i think is what we call cathodically protected we're essentially pumping electrons into it so as the gold tries to oxidize actually we're always no as the gold the gold is being protected by the fact that we're trying to put electrons into that gold so we're keeping the gold in place see when you're doing the oxidation there's a possibility that you're oxidizing the gold and the gold just essentially solubilizes and flakes away but on the reduction curve you can't turn the gold into gold cations because you keep pumping electrons into it so it's what we call cathodically protected so i think i understand why uh, well i understand why the oxidation wave is where the delamination takes place and why it then doesn't happen on the reduction wave um it is possible that what they're trying to do is possible because um um there are um glucose electrodes made with this kind of technology do i advise it <sighs> do, I, do i advise it there's lots of ways of making electro we make really good electrodes using our screen printing we also do do this um this vapor deposition of gold whether you use one or the other really it's all about the business model but i think it takes quite a few hours of discussion with zp to really figure out what's the best fit for making your particular product i mean you can use printed circuit boards you can use screen printed in screen printing you can use vapor deposition there are all sorts of ways of making electrodes what i find interesting though is this is a commercial um essentially um glucose sensor and the gold in that um if you look at the cv it's really interesting actually that they get nice CV. They don't get this oxidation and delamination um, on this wave. Obviously, the reduction wave is nice. But what's interesting to see is the peak-to-peak -peak separation is 500 millivolts. I'm perfectly happy with 500 millivolts. I don't care. Now, if you read the literature, that they'll say, oh, you need 59 millivolts. What this says is don't get hung up on having perfect cycle voltammetry and perfect peak-to-peak -peak separation when making practical devices like a glucose strip it doesn't matter that much but i have seen a lot of perfectly good electrode materials being rejected because they didn't fulfill some criteria about peak to peak separation here the peak to peak separation is 500 millivolts um, and this material has been used to make billions of glucose sensors don't get over um, hung up on cyclovoltammetry and just i just want to say hi to ali and just FYI, we do cover this in quite a lot of detail during um, our workshops as well. Um, question number five, um, urine, um, urinalysis, um, the um, detection of analytes in urine, for example. So somebody's trying to make a urinalysis um, system and, and they want to know the cost of making this kind of IVD type technology. So if I use the glucose meter as an example, at least when I was much more active in glucose strips, glucose strips become very commoditized, so there's less interest in the R&D, but um, the meters were something like $15 um, dollars worth of cost in them, and the strips were cost to manufacturers at scale. At scale, it's really important. I'm really going to emphasize that. Look, you know, a glucose strip can cost something like, you know, five cents to manufacture, but you have to do it at scale. So the quick answer is, what's the kind of, um, what, what's the sort of lowest you could expect to be able to make a electrochemical biosensor at? Well, you could probably make it at five cents, but you do have to get to scale. Now, five cents does cover the substrate, the deposition of these enzymes, and the formation of a very simple microfluidic device on it. So it's not, you know, a one-step process. This is a 20-step process easily, and all the quality system that has to go around this. Um, I was having a look at urinalysis, and you obviously people are interested in glucose, pH, ketones, and bilirubin, um, urobilinogen, and blood, and leukocytes, and nitrites, and proteins, and uh, I've added on cortisol at the end here. Glucose is quite doable. You know, we've obviously done that a lot. We have a glucose sensor, pH sensor, ketone sensor. I actually have um, direct experience of doing bilirubin. Um, I should have looked at this Euro um, bilinogen molecule, but that will be a sort of organic molecule with lots of aromatic rings and heteroatoms, so it will be electrochemically active. Blood, there's definitely um, blood is something you can detect by electrochemical techniques. Um, leukocyte esterase, I have worked on those sensors; they work fine. 
nitrite we've actually worked on a nitrite sensor as well um proteins they are definitely detectable by electrochemistry and so we have also have a cortisol sensor as well so um what we do so zp just to say you know we obviously have a whole bunch of biosensors and in that list that i was just looking at we have um, glucose and ph and ketone and cortisol we have many more sensors as well it's probably always worth checking back with us i'd also contact us as well because i think the rate of our development is sometimes faster than the rate of our um man of i'm um, sorry of our ability to put it on the website so but here's some useful links um just to say on that what i would say is that if people are used to you know you um understand you know that there's a um these urine sticks which detect you know many analytes urine sticks are great you know in terms of um they're low cost they're fairly simple to use um but if you want to digitize that then this whole mvp platform that i was talking about um at the start where we can we can probably take most of the chemistries that are already developed on a um, urine stick and translate it onto electrochemical sensor um really there's you know that's something that we're pretty um good at and then you basically got yourself towards an mvp now we do understand that when people are trying to do um panels you know they'll want to test you know six analytes for example six is a good number because we've already put together a handheld device for now being able to do um six analytes um in parallel um so this exists um and something that we work on at zp so as i say we're able to take samples like say urine and this does go back to question one at the very beginning of this webinar as well and um turn them into mvps um, pretty quickly i just want to be very quick on this point because i made this point in the past anyone who's doing trying to who's being serious about developing an ivd and in vitro diagnostic um we do at zp cover this in our workshops but i'll just put a quick slide up here you know this is a couple of ivds this is istat that was um developed in the early 80s for 50 million um and there's a you know i know the abaxis system this was something that was kind of launched in the early 90s but these are all examples of ivds and and the, the year that they were essentially got regulatory approval and the cost that it took them to get to regulatory approval um there's epocal there as well um and epocal was the same founder as istat 20 years apart but on average that was about 38 million for these companies to get to regulatory approval um if we took out one of the outliers which was a particularly simple device called tier lab that was actually 42 million um it's probably worth saying that if we um, adjusted those um, prices for what's called the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, so we moved those 1980s pricing to 2021 pricing, um, the average um, the average um, cost to actually bring these things to market was uh, more like 83 million, and this is unfortunately this is reasonable now i think with i think there's what i call the zp effect that we do this a lot quicker and a lot lower cost than historical and the reason being is that i think um the use of cash in startups is not necessarily as efficient as you would want a lot of people are learning their craft during those startup days and so essentially the investor is paying for the people to learn their craft obviously with somebody like zp you know we have all the manufacturing and all the people in place and all the systems in place to get good you know it's taken us you know well me 23 years and the company um nine years so it, it does take a while and um most of the time the cash that's used in startups is actually to try and get people al along that learning curve but it's w interesting to note that istat um took nine years to get there um whereas the second time around the founder so that sort of zp effect the same founder um he actually did it in six years so he did you know save um both time but actually he saved real cost and um, the second time around as well so that's the kind of price of, of um, experience and i do hear rumors that he's actually going to do it a third time as well so i put that out there just to kind of say that um this is the kind of money that you should be thinking about and raising when i'm um, thinking about doing a startup so questions this week um we had us about a seven step um, plan there how to get to an mvp in question one glucose sensing and cell culture just to say that yeah we've been doing this a long time now and actually we do have a total stack of technologies so good that we're actually able to implant this into um fish 
um, easy flex this is something that we're working on with this you know sort of um, with this particular user the vapor deposited gold yeah their gold de delaminated and in the end I just think that their gold was too thin and not uh, well enough adhered to the substrate but it as they you know in the emails discussions I've had with them it can work it's just sometimes it's not you know it's not adding that much value to you you know you can get hold of perfectly good commercial gold electrodes I mean, obviously from Zimmer and Peacock um question number five urinalysis sensor so you know your fundamental costs for a glucose meter is about 15 dollars worth of cost in that um meter and about five cents on the glucose strip but 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 you have to get to really high volume um so that's your sort of the floor of your of your costs i would say so thank you very much if you've got any questions don't hesitate to reach out to us at zp um, thank you for Ali um, for joining today. If you've got any questions, as I say, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Okay, thanks very much.